So our, our next speaker is Dr. Carcao, uh, who got his medical training at the University of Toronto, uh, finishing in 1990, and then in 2007 got a Master's of Science in Clinical Epidemiology at uh, Toronto as well. He's a staff pediatric hematologist uh, in the Division of Hematology Oncology and an associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics at SickKids Hospital here. Uh, and he's co-director of the Comprehensive Care Pediatric Hemophilia Clinic and a senior associate scientist, clinician investigator in the hospital's research institute. Uh, his research interests are in the study of congenital bleeding disorders and in particular the study of interpatient disease variability with respect to inhibitor development. So we already heard a little bit about variability between patients and, and his talk specifically will apply that to the inhibitor side. Um, he, uh, in this capacity, has participated and led a number of clinical trials uh, on the use of neuroextended half-life concentrates in children, and has substantial clinical and research interest in childhood immune thrombocytopenia, hereditary spherocytosis, and the medical management of vascular tumors and malformations. Uh, Dr. Carcao has served in many organizational administrative roles nationally and internationally. Uh, he is a past president of AHCDC uh, and past and current chair of the inhibitor committee. Uh, he was Canadian representative on the Hemophilia Thrombosis Research Society, uh, and he's currently the chair of the Canadian Pediatric Thrombosis Hemostasis Network, the Canadian Hemophilia Society Peer Review Committee, and the International Network of Pediatric Hemophilia. And if this wasn't enough, he's also on the editorial board of several well-known journals and has been an invited lecturer and author or co-author of over 120 peer-reviewed papers and lecture chapters, a uh, textbook chapter, sorry. And he's going to speak today on inhibitor management, what's new? Thank you. So that really stimulates me to reduce that bio. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. <laughs> okay, that's going to be very much curtailed. So uh, good morning to all, um, and, um, and welcome <clears throat> to this. So my uh, title uh, for this presentation is Inhibitor Management, What's New? Uh, before starting, condolences to all of those that are from Ottawa and from all of those who stayed up very late and are quite tired uh, this morning. So uh, I wish to thank the Canadian Hemophilia Society and the Planning Committee for this meeting for the kind invitation to, uh, to present to you today. Here is a speaker disclosure. I've worked with many companies in, in the room. Um, unfortunately, I don't own any company. <laughs> Um, so as you all know, hemophilia is a bleeding disorder. Patients with hemophilia get many different types of bleeds, and I'm showing you here. And this happens quite often um, uh, for patients. Of course, uh, prophylaxis changes everything. Prophylaxis is defined as the regular infusion of factor to prevent bleeding is not easy, but it's effective. <clears throat> With good adherence, or really great adherence to prophylaxis, patients with hemophilia can essentially go through their life with very, very, very few, or possibly even no bleeds, but it's not easy. But all of this changes. If a patient with severe hemophilia, particularly severe hemophilia A, develops an inhibitor. <clears throat> If a patient develops an inhibitor, in essence, they're sort of an unlucky one. Um, the other patients, they just have hemophilia. But if you develop an inhibitor, now things are much, much, much worse, <clears throat> as you can see here. Kind of sad. So inhibitors, as I think all of you know, are antibodies to factor. And they occur when a person with hemophilia receives factor and their immune system sees that factor as a foreign protein, and then consequently they can develop an inhibitor or an antibody against that factor. And the consequences are that such antibodies will inhibit or destroy the activity of factor, and consequently the patient no longer responds to factor. Inhibitor development is a huge problem with both clinical and economic ramifications. Clinically, inhibitor patients have more difficult to treat bleeds, increased susceptibility to life-threatening bleeds such as intracranial hemorrhages. They develop worse joint disease and worse quality of life. And here's an example for you. This is a patient uh, of ours at the Hospital for Sick Children who in October of last year, when he was 17 months of age and had a high teeter inhibitor, developed a left subdural hematoma. For all of you who can't see that subdural hematoma, I'll make it a little bit easier for you. There it is. That's a big, big bleed in the head. <clears throat> That's some of the things that can happen when you have an inhibitor. 
<laughs> inhibitor development is also a huge problem from an economic point of view. Treating patients with inhibitors is extremely expensive, and for much of the world, it's impossible to treat <clears throat> because it's just too expensive. So this is what I'm going to talk about in terms of what's new in inhibitor management. And I'm going to focus on three things. One, preventing inhibitors. Two, when to start ITI. And three, new products to manage patients with inhibitors. So first, preventing inhibitors. Inhibitor development is not rare. It's pretty common. As you can see there in red, 25 to 40 percent of all patients with severe hemophilia A will develop inhibitors. The incidence is less with mild or moderate forms of hemophilia A and also with hemophilia B, but it's very common in hemophilia A. So who gets an inhibitor and who doesn't get an inhibitor? I'm showing you there nine boys. Assume that they all have severe hemophilia A. Can you predict who's going to develop an inhibitor? The answer is no. Now you can guess, <laughs> and you might be right, but you might be wrong. So no one <clears throat> has a 0% risk of developing an inhibitor, but also no one has a 100% risk of developing an inhibitor. So it's very difficult to know who's going to and who's not going to. On average, three out of those nine children will develop an inhibitor, but you just don't know who. Inhibitor development occurs early on in life, usually when a child is one to two years of age and after about 10 to 15 exposures to factor. But you need exposure to factor to get an inhibitor. If you don't get exposed to factor, you're not going to develop an inhibitor. <clears throat> so because you need exposure to factor, does it make a difference what factor you get exposed to early on in life? And particularly, does it make a difference if you get a plasma-derived factor versus a recombinant factor? Over the years, beginning in 2006, and actually even earlier than that, there have been many studies that show that there is a higher risk of inhibitor development with a recombinant uh, factor VIII. So shown in blue is the inhibitor incidence with recombinant factor VIII from various studies. And in red is the incidence of inhibitors with plasma-derived factor VIII. And as you can see here on this study from France, <clears throat> the inhibitor incidence with recombinant was 32.3% and with plasma-derived, 10.2%. So more inhibitors <clears throat> with recombinant in blue. From the UK, 27 versus 14. <clears throat> from um, a mainly European study, uh, and Montreal, 29% <laughs> um, uh, versus 24%. This is a meta-analysis done by Alfonso Iorio, who I think is here in the room, um, and where he uh, accumulated many studies, put them all together, and looked at the incidence of inhibitor development. And 27.4 versus 14.3, and finally, the most recent European paper, 26.3 versus 21.6. And yes, you can see that the blue is always more than the red. So as a result of this, and this is what's new in the last year or so, this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine last year, about a year ago right now. And this is a study entitled, A Randomized Trial of Factor VIII and, Neut and Neutralizing Antibodies in Hemophilia A, but we better know it as the SIPID study. In this study, previously untreated patients, those are pups, generally very young children, as you see there, were randomized <clears throat> to either receiving a recombinant factor VIII or a plasma-derived factor VIII. And because of time, I'll just skip to the results, and there are the results. The incidence of inhibitor development in this randomized study was 44.5 versus 26.8. So if I asked you right now, what gives more inhibitors, recombinant versus plasma-derived, I think I know what most of you would be saying right now. <clears throat> All of these are saying the same thing. There's less inhibitors with plasma derived. There's more inhibitors with recombinant. So based on these studies, do we know which factor eight to start pups on? Many of you would say, yes, start them on a plasma derived. But, in fact, <laughs> we still probably don't know. After all of this and all of this effort, I don't think we still know. So you can pick either yes or no, 
you'll neither be right nor will you be wrong. That's like a perfect thing to have, right? <laughs> yeah. in, 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 in school, this would be a perfect thing. So whatever you say, you're always right. Um, many have criticized the SIPA study. So whenever you do a study such as this, big ramifications, there's always lots of criticism. And this just came out this month. This is from the European Medicine Agency, which is the equivalent of Health Canada or of the FDA in Europe. And they stated, there is no clear and consistent evidence of a difference in inhibitor development between classes of factor eight molecules. And that's really a shame to have done all of this work and still in the end, we're still, we just don't know. So on top of that, the landscape has changed. You just heard from Shannon that there are now newer products, recombinant extended half-life factor eight. There's also human cell line derived factor eight. These are some of the newer products. Adinovate is not yet available in Canada, but it might be, become available. Um, again, for time, I'm not gonna go through the, the attributes of these products, but I will say that some of them, there are reasons to think that they may have less inhibitor development than what we've had in the past. Some of these are human cell line derived, just much like plasma derived is obviously made in humans, us. Um, some of these have something bound to the factor eight, which may shield epitopes on the factor eight from the immune system, much like von Willebrand factor does um, in plasma derived factor eight. So there is a uh, reason to think that maybe these things uh, might have less inhibitor development. So we're still in a bit of a, a pickle in that of these three options, we still don't really know which one to start. So uh, if any of you were thinking it was pretty obvious, it's not so obvious. Now let's go to when to start ITI. So immune tolerance induction therapy or ITI is something that was um, by luck, essentially found by Dr. Hans Brockman in Bonn, Germany in 1974. ITI refers to the frequent and regular exposure to factor to make a person with an inhibitor gradually tolerant of factor. ITI is difficult. <clears throat> it's difficult because in most cases you have to give factor every day. Most patients, because they're very young, will need a port. It also doesn't occur in a month or so. It takes one to two years on average to tolerate someone. So you can imagine daily exposure to factor, somebody has to stick a needle into a child every single day, probably for one to two years. It's also as a result very expensive because you're using a lot of factor. And after all of that, it's only successful in 60 to 70% of cases. So this is difficult. <clears throat> And because it's so difficult and it's so expensive, you want to get it right and do everything to maximize the likelihood of success. And one of the questions is, when to start ITI? There was a, a number of registry data in the 1990s that showed that ITI was more successful if the inhibitor teeter at the start of ITI was low, was less than 10 Bethesda units. So we measure the amount of inhibitor on this uh, unit called the Bethesda unit. If you have no inhibitor, you're zero. If you have a little bit of inhibitor, you have one, two, three Bethesda units. And if you have more, it's, the number is higher. The highest I've seen is about 1,200. Um, so the question is, um, uh, a study show that if you start ITI when there's not much inhibitor, patients do better. But this was misinterpreted, I think, because what happened is that uh, the community, the hemophilia community said, well, based on this, then you should wait if the inhibitor teeter is greater than 10 until it drops to less than 10 to start ITI. And most centers in North America, including our own here in Toronto and in most uh, of Europe, adopted this policy. But I think it was a misinterpretation. And the reason why I think it was a misinterpretation is that um, patients who start with a low inhibitor teeter so less than 10 Bethesda units, really represent two types of patients. They represent the patient in whom the inhibitor teeter was never very high. The inhibitor teeter was five, six, seven Bethesda units, never went any higher. And that's a very good group with a very high likelihood of ITI success. If you combine that group with patients who did go above 10, but then the inhibitor teeter was allowed to drop, if you that group is not a good group in the sense that they have a much lower likelihood of ITI success. But if you combine the two, then in yellow, you get an overall good likelihood of ITI success. And then if you compare that to the patients who start at greater than 10, 
the, the patients who start less than 10 are gonna do better. But it's a false thing because you've incorporated into that patients who never were above 10 and you should not have done that. Um, and not everybody did. The Germans ignored those, that registry data. They had their own registry data and they always continued to just start ITI immediately and they've always shown the best results. And I think it's mainly from that and not because of the type of plasma of, of factor that they've been administering. So six to seven years ago at the Hospital for Sick Children, we basically changed our policy. We started to immediately start ITI when a patient develops an inhibitor. And I will tell you that Peter Collins from the UK, he's head of the UK Hemophilia Center uh, Doctors Organization. I spoke to him a couple weeks ago. They have just changed their guidelines in the UK and they're recommending starting immediately. So I think the world is now changing, and any of you in any of the Canadian centers, I think you should do this as well. And others have. So this was a study that was published a year and a half ago, and this was uh, a study from Marilyn Manco Johnson and Amy Shapiro in their groups in the United States. And what they did is they compared the success rate of ITI in 39 patients with high teeter inhibitors and they looked at the success rate depending on when they started ITI. So for those patients who started ITI, within one month of inhibitor detection, they found a success rate of 96%. For those patients who started more than six months after inhibitor detection, the success rate was only 64%. So that's a pretty big difference over there. So uh, they've adopted that. The other thing is that within those 23 patients that started within a month, 13 of them had an inhibitor teeter of uh, 10 Bethesda units or more, and all of them were successful, successfully tolerized. So when do you start? I think you should start immediately. And, uh, and we have. <laughs> uh, and we try to start within one week of inhibitor development. The last thing, and I'm only going to touch upon this because the next speaker is going to go into much more depth on this, is what's new, and the big thing is there are a lot of new products that are coming. So what have we had to manage inhibitors until now? Well, we've had two things, two bypassing agents, uh, FIBA and Niastase, which are shown here. <coughs> These are old products. Hard to believe, but FIBA is almost 40 years old. I don't think many of you are using any products that were, built, that were uh, started 40 years ago. Certainly not your phones that you have with you and, uh, and not so many other things, not your car, uh, et cetera. And even uh, Naya stays, which is a newer product, but it's also about 20 years old. These products are effective in treating bleeds. However, they're not so good for prophylaxis. They've been used for prophylaxis, but they only reduce the bleeding rate by about 50 to 60, 70%, which in comparison to not having an inhibitor and being on prophylaxis where you could almost virtually eliminate or 100% reduction, these are not so good. On top of that, they're inconvenient. FIBA has to be given over around 45 minutes, although many people do give it faster. Uh, it's a large volume. Niastase has a very short half-life and you have to give it very frequently, so they're not very convenient. But new products are coming. The cavalry is sort of coming. This is sort of going to be my last slide. <clears throat> so these are new therapies for hemophilia that are currently being studied, and some of them are really close to being licensed. Emicizumab, the one at the top, might be licensed by the end of this year, at least in the United States. And in yellow over there are products that can be used for patients with inhibitors. So we've only had two products up until now, and now look how many there are there that can potentially be used in patients with inhibitors. We have extended half-life recombinant factor 7A. So this is longer acting 7A that allows you not to have to give it every two hours. There is emicizumab, you're gonna hear a lot more about that. <clears throat> There are other products, Fetusaran. Again, you're gonna hear a lot more. There's a bunch of anti-TFPI products. And all of these, or most of these, can be used in patients with inhibitors. So I think that this will finally make life for patients with inhibitors much easier and result in better bleed protection. So to conclude, preventing inhibitors, are we further ahead? Not too much. When to start ITI? I think that there's a transformation occurring it should occur in Canada as well. And new products to manage uh, in inhibitor patients, there is a lot of stuff coming 
we're going to have to figure out how to use them. And with that, I thank you for your attention.